Hello, and welcome to today's presentation by Richard Weissman, entitled The Casino Paradigm. My name is Doug Jansen. I work in the Denver CKG headquarters. I'm taking the place of Betty Smith, who's on vacation this week. And um, it's we're excited to uh, have Richard uh, do this presentation for you. I've known Richard for the last three years. I've um, helped Richard put on some advanced modeling classes for EMI, which is Energy Management Institute, mainly in Houston and Calgary. Um, Richard has uh, over 20 years of trading experience from the floor of the NYMEX exchange to uh, now that he, uh, outside of um, running books and educating traders, he's also a fund manager. Richard, um, in addition to being a fund manager, also puts out daily trade recommendations that I hope he uh, touches on um, at the end of his presentation. He's up 66% uh, for last year and 48% year to date on his daily trades. Richard has also written two books. One is the Mechanical Trading Systems book, and just recently, which came out last year, the Trade Like a Casino. Um, we will be giving away a signed copy of Trade Like a Casino um, to one of the attendees at the end of this presentation. And I will notify you who that is. Um, actually, I'm sorry, we notify you after the presentation's over. All uh, question and answers um, based on the presentation will be taken at the end. This is a recorded WebEx, so you'll be able to come back to it uh, in, our, in our WebEx archives at a later date. And if you guys have any issues with um, the sound not coming through or something visual not looking right, please go ahead and, and uh, notify our moderator, Ami, through the chat functionality of WebEx. And let me see, did I miss? Oh, one last thing. Um, CKG does recently started a CKG blog. Um, Richard contributes to that blog. It's called the Weissman Edge. And you can go get to that blog by just simply typing in on a browser, news.cqg.com. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and let Richard take over and, uh, and start from here. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Doug. So to begin, I wanted to go over this concept of the casino paradigm, which is the body of the presentation that I'll give. Um, so when I started as a trader, one of the things that I asked other more experienced traders on the floor was, what's the parallel to successful speculation? And um, Typically, the answer was, uh, that I was given was that there is no parallel. Uh, but as I learned more and more about what successful speculation was, it became obvious to me that there was a parallel, but perhaps most speculators didn't want to mention it in order to somehow, with the thought that it would diminish what the career of speculation was. But it seemed obvious to me that the parallel was the gaming industry. And so um, part one of my second book, Trade Like a Casino, uh, is entitled The Casino Paradigm. So the question that I ask is, what would we compare successful speculative trading to? Um, and the answer is the gaming industry. So a player walks into a casino. Is it possible that two hours later the player could walk out with more money? Of course that's possible, otherwise no one would ever enter into a gaming house. Why aren't the casinos shaking in their boots at that possibility? Because they know that whatever game the player chooses, the odds are always stacked against them, against the player, and in favor of the casino. In trading, we call having probability skewed in your favor positive expectancy. Positive expectancy is not a cutesy way of saying that you make money. Instead, it means that after deducting for costs, um, the spread between the bid and the ask and commission, you still make money. And I'll give you a brief overview of the different types of tools that can be used in order to um, develop these positive expectancy models. But even in the gaming industry, positive expectancy is not enough. For example, Bill walks into the same casino. He's got a cashier's check for a billion dollars. He walks over to the window and says, turn it into chips. And they will. When he takes his wheelbarrow full of chips over to the roulette wheel and says, put it all on red, going to take that specific bet, 
In fact, they won't. Despite the fact that they realize that they have probability skewed in their favor, they recognize that on any single spin of the roulette wheel, the low probability event could occur, and then Bill Gates would own the casino. Bad business model. So what they do is they create table limits. They say, well, Mr. Gates, we'd love to have you play here, but on this particular roulette wheel, we have a 10,000 per spin limit. By forcing the player to bet smaller, they ensure that eventually, if he keeps playing long enough, they'll take the whole billion dollars. And in the world of trading, we call table limits risk management. And I'll talk about some of the rudimentary forms of risk management um, in this presentation as well. Now, in the gaming industry, that's all you really need. All you need is um, probability skewed in your favor and table limits. Unfortunately, in the world of trading, you need a third element that casinos really don't need. And in order to understand that third element, which I call trader discipline, I introduce the analogy of the opaque urn. So there's an urn. I put it into the center of the room. By definition, it's opaque. You can't see what's inside of it, but I'm telling you what's inside of it. It contains 60 green balls and 40 red balls. I ask you to bet on a color. Of course, you choose green. Out pops the first red ball. Now there's only 39 balls. I ask you to do it again. Green even more so. Out pops the second red ball. And then once again, you bet green, the third red ball comes out. At this point, behavioral psychologists tell us that most people will give up and say, this is not for me, and they'll just walk away a loser. The rare individual now decides that the way to win at this particular game is to bet on the red ball because what I was telling you was not factual. And then the green ones start popping up, and then you're really done. So it's not that positive expectancy models do not exist. In fact, they do exist um, with a little bit of time and effort and help from someone uh, over at CQG like Doug. Um, you can very easily develop a uh, positive expectancy model. And actually, in Chapter 8 of Trade of the Casino, I give you a couple of throwaway models. And we'll discuss a couple of those simple models in this presentation as well. It's not that people can't manage the risk, although this is where most speculative traders fall apart. It's that very few traders on the high probability So what are positive expectancy models? They generally come in uh, two flavors or a combination of the two flavors. One of the more popular types of positive expectancy models are models based upon technical analysis. Um, and then the other type of positive expectancy models are based upon fundamental analysis. Uh, and then, of course, we have models that can combine technicals and fundamentals. Um, a lot of people look at technical and fundamentals as an either-or proposition. In fact, I would argue that the best traders um, execute based upon the technicals, uh, but they uh, supplement their technical work with fundamental analysis. So what do we mean by technicals? Technicals are based upon price history. Um, and what do we mean by fundamentals? Fundamentals are based upon supply, demand, weather, geopolitics, all those types of factors. So um, technical analysis in its most simple iteration is based upon the concept of price having memory, and I'll give you an example of that in slides to come. In trading, I like to say that um, you get to pick your poison. So generally speaking, positive expectancy models um, come in three different flavors. They are trend following, counter trend, and then scalping. Some iterations of this third type of technical program is you know, out of the money option writing or high frequency trading. So the poison that trend following traders have to endure is what I like to call death by a thousand paper cuts. So a paper cut is not so bad. Certainly, we can take a paper cut and survive, but taking paper cut after paper cut after paper cut 
after a while you're going to get sick of it. That's what long-term trend following is. The opposite end of the spectrum from trend following positive expectancy models is what I like to call either scalping or getting deep out of the money, calls and puts, or high frequency trading. So we call this type of positive expectancy model picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. So, you know, every day you pick up pennies, pick up the pennies, pick up the pennies, until eventually one day, unfortunately, you get rolled over and um, you lose, in, instead of picking up pennies, you lose dollar bills. Um, and then you go on to the next day and begin picking up pennies over and over again. Um, and then a uh, kind of intermediate between these two extremes are what I like to call counter trend models. Um, so unlike the simple trend following models, which have um, uh, inferior percent winning uh, realities, winning less than 50% on, on a trade, uh, but positive and uh, superior average profit to average loss ratios. These models are closer to the scalping in terms of the fact that they have more wins than losses, but they suffer from inferior uh, average profit to average loss ratios. So those are the three types of technical models. Um, interesting, they all join in positive experience. You just pick the type of um, that best suits your needs as a leader. Fundamental, hey, I'm, Richard. I'm I'm sorry. Yes. Can I I need to interrupt you here. You okay. are breaking up a little bit. Um, if you're on a speakerphone, maybe speaking into the headset or bringing it closer to the, to your mouth. You did drop off a few times, and if it happens again, I'll just have you call back in. But okay, is this any better? That that sounds better. But okay, uh, let's see how so it maybe... goes. And and I might interrupt you one more time. But go ahead. Thanks. That's fine. I'm just going to speak a little louder and a little more into the receiver. So fundamental analysis, and a simple example of this would be um, uh, a rally on bearish news, uh, decline on bullish news, and, uh, and buying into that uh, rally or selling into that decline. Why? Because if the market is rallying on bad news, that is the most bullish information that the market can give us about um, demand vis-a-vis -vis its inability to fall on bad news. Uh, someone actually needs the stuff. Okay, so this is an example of why technical analysis works. Very simple example. Technical analysis is based upon price having memory, what do we mean by that? We mean that someone actually bought crude oil at $40 a barrel. So, for example, right here, uh, they bought $40 a barrel in, uh, in 1990, and they had all sorts of reasons for buying. Um, certainly, you know, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, um, and there's a fear of disruption of supply. All of these reasons combine uh, in order to drive prices up to the resistance level of $40. But as the allied response comes in and as prices fall, uh, you can see that all the people that bought that level are now experiencing pain. And consequently, when the price tests $40 again, they become sellers. Why? Because $40 actually means something to them. It means the termination of the painful experience of loss. So when it hits $40 again, they can minimize that pain of loss and, um, and get out at the price that means something to them, $40, the end of the painful experience of loss. Um, $40 also means something to another group of traders, um, the group that sold to the first group. So uh, we don't know exactly where they bought back. Maybe they bought back here, or maybe they bought back here. It really doesn't matter. They have a pleasurable experience associated with that linear price of $40. So when it returns to $40, they want a repetition of, of the um, pleasurable experience of gain, so they sell again. 
Um, and then, of course, we see that the price goes above $40. Now they're wrong. And consequently, when it returns to $40 here, uh, they minimize the painful experience of loss by buying back. And $40 has now shifted from what we call resistance to support. Now, interestingly enough, we have a paradigm shift. This is where the fundamental supply, demand, geopolitics, weather, all these factors come into play. Um, and specifically at this time in history in, in crude oil, uh, the factors that are coming into play are emerging market demand out of China primarily, secondarily India, other countries like that. So this is why fundamentals help, is helping us to identify this paradigm shift, this intermediate to long-term shift in the perception of value of the asset. Um, fast forward the clocks to 2008, Lehman Brothers is in bankruptcy. Um, the price of oil is 110 a barrel, and I'm teaching classes to a bunch of young oil traders, and they ask me, where do I think oil's trading, or where do I think oil is heading, and my answer shocks them, $40 a barrel. But of course, based upon technical, that answer makes perfect sense, because price still has memory. The old resistance from 1991, 1990, 1991, is now going to be support, and sure enough, Roughly speaking, that's where we bottom during the 09 Great Recession. So why technical analysis helps, like I said, in the simplest iteration, it's because price has memory. Um, the other reason why technical analysis helps is because uh, the distribution of prices is not a bell curve distribution. Instead, prices display leptokurtosis, greater propensity towards mean reversion and greater propensity for a fat tail event than what would be assumed in a mean, in a, uh, in a mean reverting market. Um, so there you have mean reversion, and there you have the fat tail and the distribution. Interestingly enough, two of the main uh, types of technical tools, um, trend following indicators like moving averages, trying to help us identify when we're in that fat tail in the distribution, and mean reverting indicators like oscillators, trying to help us identify when we're, uh, when the, uh, or trying to capitalize on when markets are in that mean reverting mode. So it sounds simple, markets can only do things, trade in a range or trend, why is it so difficult to make money trading? Because successful trading requires that we consistently do that which is psychologically uncomfortable and unnatural. So mean reverting systems are psychologically uncomfortable and unnatural because success requires that we fade or do the opposite of the, um, of the consensus. So if markets are rallying, we're supposed to sell. If they're falling, we're supposed to, to buy, which is the exact opposite of what um, the news media is telling us to do at the time that we're achieving these prices. Trend following, even more difficult. Um, you need to buy new highs, sell new lows. So for those that are familiar with the soybean market or the grain market, um, you know, buying $13 beans uh, when, it, when soybeans make new highs, make new all-time highs, um, it seems counterintuitive. Why would you buy here when just you know months ago it was trading below the teens? Uh, but in fact, of course, you know a high price means nothing if we're going to sixteen dollars a bushel. Okay, so here I'm going to show you a very simple trend following model. It's based upon one of my favorite concepts. One of my favorite concepts in technical analysis is that if most people using technical tools uh, and most speculators fail, we can make money by doing the opposite of what they're doing with those tools. So most people just blindly look at relative strength index, RSI, as an overbought, oversold tool in a vacuum. And therefore, any time they get a reading above 65, they'll just blindly sell. Every time they get a reading below 35, they'll just blindly buy. So we're going to make the money that they're going to lose. Every time that the nine-day RSI crosses above 65, we will buy and we'll put a stop loss um, at the lowest low of the prior 10 bars, and every time that 
RSI gets somewhat oversold and has a reading below 35, we will sell and we'll put a stop, a buy stop at the highest high of the prior 10 days. And sure enough, although it although this trade experienced more losers than winners, you can see it only had 46% winners. Um, it made money overall, as you can see here, because the average win, 2,500, is twice as big as the average loss, 1,200. Remember what I said earlier about the opaque earn and having to experience multiple paper cut small losses. Well, you can see that here over the course of a 10-year backtest in soybeans. In order to enjoy this profit of $44,000, you needed to um, continue to play the high probability trade and take the small losses not three times in a row, but eight times in a row. If you can't do that, you don't get the $44,000 profit. Instead, you experience this maximum drawdown amount of 18000 So uh, it's, it can be done, certainly. Is it easy? Of course not. Okay, so this is a 10-year back test of that same RSI trend system for a diverse uh, portfolio of assets, including the E-mini S&P, WTI crude oil, natural gas, gold, soybeans, 10-year notes, the euro against the dollar, uh, the yen against the dollar, and sugar. So you can see here um, the beauty of trading a portfolio is that the profits are additive and the drawdowns are not additive. Why not? Because when, for example, natural gas is experiencing its drawdown, that's when uh, soybeans are making new highs. When soybeans are experiencing its drawdown, that's when crude oil is making new highs, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can see that the, um, the total profits for the portfolio are better than any single asset in the portfolio for that reason. Notice also that uh, typical of a simple trend following model, more losing trades than winning trades, but look at the average profit to loss ratio, almost the average profit around twice as big as the average loss, that's why it enjoyed positive expectancy overall. Okay, moving on. Um, this is a simple counter trend model, and this is based upon another um, key point that I tend to emphasize in my courses and in, in the books that I write, um, which is if you are going to fight the, uh, the short-term trend, it, uh, you have greater odds of success if you are trading in the direction of the long-term trend. So now, long entry will occur when RSI is somewhat oversold. But notice that there's a second criteria that you're still above the 200-day simple moving average. So you're buying when it's oversold in the context of a long-term bull market. And third criteria, we want to enter this trade when there's evidence that the volume is drying up. In other words, as we're approaching uh, this oversold condition and we're approaching the long-term support, the 200-day moving average, it's not that more traders are willing to put new money at risk. It's that less and less traders are, are willing to put new money at risk as the market is getting oversold. Exit will occur if, uh, according to this model, if uh, we get slightly overbought or we get stopped out. Short entry, short exit, same concept, opposite direction. Okay, and here's uh, an example on a chart of what I was just explaining to you with words. So here you can see we um, close above the 200-day moving average, still in a bull market, and simultaneously RSI is temporarily oversold. And third criteria, the volume is drying up. So, um, and sure enough, the trend is still a bull market, and you can see RSI gets somewhat overbought, and we close out for profit. 
And people like these types of models because, as you can see, uh, more winners than losers. People like to have winning trades. So these tend to be more popular. Um, and, uh, and that tends to be the, uh, the big plus to these things. Okay, and then here you can see the same portfolio of assets. And again, the profits are additive, but the drawdowns are not additive. Um, so consequently, the, um, the, uh, the profit to maximum drawdown ratio um, tends to be better than many of the components within the portfolio. And again, like I said, people like this stuff because you have more winners than losers. 64% wins. But notice that um, the average profit tends to be slightly smaller than the average loss. So that's the trade-off. Okay, so here's the big payoff, is that um, it's not an either-or choice you can simultaneously execute a trend following system and the mean reversion system. And again, the profits are additive, the drawdowns are not additive. So um, they tend to smooth out each other's peaks and valleys. Since they both enjoy positive expectancy overall, you get the best of both worlds. Um, so of course, there's more um, trend following trades um, than mean reversion trades. Uh, so you have uh, still less than 50% wins, um, but notice that you have uh, bigger profits than losses. Okay, so that is the first piece of the casino paradigm, positive expectancy models, and there I showed you just a couple of simple models. Um, Moving on to the next piece in the casino paradigm, uh, we have the risk management pyramid. So um, I developed the risk management pyramid because it addressed one of the fallacies of uh, risk management when I entered the industry in the 1980s, and it was that there were these two mutually exclusive schools of risk management. The first school was using these classic quantitative tools, stop losses, and volumetric position sizing, and this other school, um, mainly um, uh, chief risk officers and academicians, was using an entirely different set of tools like value at risk and stress testing. So instead of an either-or proposition, I came up with the risk management pyramid, and you can see that you use um, all the tools. Um, and uh, you augment them with management discretion. So the simplest of tools uh, are stop losses, um, and then uh, they're, they're pretty simple and straightforward. Obviously, you saw examples of stop losses in the two throwaway models that we just went through when I was discussing positive expectancy models. In addition, we talk about volumetric position sizing, and this introduces the concept of fixed fractional money management. So, for example, um, we have this back-tested system. It experienced a, weak, a worse peak-to-valley drawdown, an equity of $10,000 on a $100,000 portfolio. We're comfortable with that 10% worst peak-to-valley drawdown during our back-test. And it turns out in the real world that we have a million to, um, to dedicate to the model. And consequently, we can trade 10 contracts and still maintain that 10% peak to valley drawdown in equity. However, the question is, was often asked in trading, how do I know when it's safe to increase my position size to 11 contracts? Well, obviously, based upon our criteria of being comfortable with a 10% worst peak to valley drawdown, once assets under management, AUM, by the way, is assets under management, uh, once assets under management increase to 1.1 million, then you would be able to safely increase your position size to 11 contracts, and you would retain the 10% fixed drawdown risk. However, you would know that it's time to decrease um, the number of contracts traded to nine if 
assets under management decreased to 900,000. And in that way, you are increasing and decreasing your contract size as assets under management increase and decrease, and thereby keeping the, um, the volumetric um, risk fixed at 10%. Okay, so here you have an example of what I just walked you through. And you can see the key point is that the risk is fixed to 10%, irrespective of how much or how little assets under management are. Okay, so the base of the pyramid is the most simple form of risk management, stop losses. How do we place our stops? Well, one of the simplest and most robust ways of choosing a stop is based upon support and resistance levels. Why? Because price has memory, as I already indicated. Another way of placing stops uh, is based upon indic indicator-driven um, stop losses. In other words, when a moving average crosses, that would be an indicator-driven stop loss. Um, one of the key uh, reasons why people like um, stop losses placed at technical support and resistance levels as opposed to indicator driven stops is that the indicator uh, will only cross or you'll know, you'll only know that its cross is valid after the trading day has ended and therefore you could be taking more risk uh, because there's no intraday stop so if you're going to use an indicator driven stop like a moving average crossover you might want to augment it with what I call um, a catastrophic stop so in other words yes I'll use use the moving average crossover as my stop, but intraday, if they break this support or resistance level based upon the catastrophic stop, I'm stopped out anyway. I'm not waiting for the day to close. Um, and then, like I said, at the base of the pyramid, we have these volumetric limits like the 1% rule. Oh, I'm sorry, like fixed, faction, fixed fractional position, position sizing methodologies. In addition, when speaking about volumetric limits, I like to introduce the 1% rule. What is the 1% rule? It says that we risk no more than 1% of assets under management on any particular trading idea. Um, so uh, what do I mean by trading idea as opposed to, to asset? So let's say that um, you're looking at multiple um, agricultural assets. So you could say, oh, yeah, I'm only risking 1%. Uh, so I'll risk 1% on soybeans. I'll risk 1% on corn. I'll risk 1% on wheat. I'll risk 1% on bean oil. I'll risk 1% on bean meal. Well, because all of these assets have strong positive correlations with each other, you're really risking more than 1% of assets under management on the single idea of grains going up. So that's uh, 1%. The idea behind 1% rule is that if your model does enjoy positive expectancy and you risk no more than 1% on any single trading idea, uh, you have a much greater probability of being able to withstand um, a, a uh, peak to valley drawdown without uh, blowing up your account. So that's the base of the pyramid, stop losses and volumetric limits. The middle tier of the pyramid uh, is a little bit more complicated, but I'll, I'll give a, uh, a basic introduction to why it adds value. And the middle tier includes value at risk and stress testing. So what this middle tier adds is the volatility of the assets being traded. In other words, if the assets are less volatile, then um, we would be able to trade more size. And if they are more volatile, we'd have to reduce our position size. Um, and uh, again, the, uh, the idea of the 1% rule and uh, of 1% on any particular trading idea leads me into the second thing that value at risk adds, which is it looks at the correlations between the assets in the portfolio and therefore um, uh, forces you to trade smaller if there's positive correlations between assets held in a portfolio and allows you to trade larger um, if the, uh, if the um, correlations are low. 
finally, I'd like to add uh, a, uh, a last piece to this idea of the risk management pyramid, and that is management discretion. Now, it's management discretion, and people with a uh, hearty risk appetite may say, ah, great, there's a way out of all these risk tools, a way to risk more. But in fact, we're talking about a risk pyramid, and therefore, management discretion can only be introduced if it augments and, um, and makes us more risk averse. So what do I mean by management discretion? Obviously, we're not getting stopped out. Uh, and um, we're not breaking our value at risk limits or our VAR limits, otherwise we wouldn't need management discretion. But let's say it's 8 o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was, 8.20 in the morning on September 11, 2001, the first plane hits um, one of the towers. So none of our volume uh, or stop loss or value at risk limits have been breached. We're still in the position, but everything that I know as a trader about risk tells me that I should lighten up on my, on my uh, positions in my portfolio. That would be an example of management discretion. And lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about trader psychology. So this is the third piece of the, um, of the casino paradigm. And Interestingly enough, uh, it brings into um, play some concepts which at first glimpse seem like they are contradictory. So I like to tell traders that the best, uh, the best uh, success in trader psychology is when you can simultaneously display iron will discipline and be incredibly flexible. So how do we do these um, seemingly contradictory um, psychological uh, traits? How do we display these seemingly psychologically um, contradictory traits? You are absolutely disciplined in terms of risk management. You never break rules of risk management discipline, such as the 1% rule. And simultaneously, you are as flexible as as possible in terms of how you perceive market behavior. The more flexible you are in terms of your ability to perceive market behavior, the less rigid you are, the better you're going to do as a trader. And I like to call um, successful trader psychology the casino mindset. What is the casino mindset in terms of trader psychology? It's behaving just like a casino. When a casino wins, they don't make a big deal about it. They're in the business of winning. And when the casino loses, they don't shut the casino down and question whether they have entered the wrong business. They recognize the losses as the price they have to pay in order to enjoy continued positive expectancy and uh, probability skew in order to be in the casino business. In terms of how, how we perceive market behavior, um, I'd like to say that there are three things that we can definitively say about market behavior without ever being contradicted. We can say that market behavior is multidimensional. In other words, markets don't just display one type of behavior over and over again. They're not just trend following. They're not just mean reverting. They're not just going up in a bull market forever, and they're not just going down in a bear market forever. So we train ourselves to, to recognize that market behavior is multidimensional, not just one type of behavior. So the one thing we know about markets is that they are not just one thing. What else can we say about market behavior without being contradicted? We can say absolutely that they are uncertain, that we have absolutely no certainty regarding whether the next tick in the market is an uptick or a downtick, unless, of course, we force it to be an uptick or a downtick by, um, by hitting a bid, lifting an offer. Otherwise, nobody can predict whether the next tick is going to be an uptick or a downtick. That uncertainty forces us to manage the risk on every single trade because we can never know with certainty whether we're going to win or lose on any particular trade. We have to manage the risk diligently on every single trade. 
what else can we say about market behavior? We can say that it is absolutely ever-changing, that uh, it will change from bull markets to bear markets, that it will change from trending markets to choppy markets, from choppy markets to trending markets over and over again. Unless there's a couple of caveats, unless we're talking about an individual equity that becomes delisted or goes into bankruptcy or is taken over, this ever-changing of, na of nature of market behavior um, is the one constant that we can always count on. Consequently, the greater our ability to perceive markets in a multidimensional fashion, the greater our success, which means that successful trading is open-mindedness. What is open-mindedness? It means not being attached to any preconceived notions of market behavior. So people being um, uh, more comfortable with the bull side of the market, more comfortable with shorting the market, that would be a preconceived notion of market behavior. So the key point is not to be bullish or bearish and be attached and stuck in that one way of perceiving the markets. The key point is to be uh, flexible and to be able to change. And when the market proves that it's a bull market, buy the market. When the market proves that it's a bear market, sell the market. When the market proves that it's stuck in a trading range, um, sell volatility, right, volatility. When the market proves that it's broken out of a trading range or that it's about to break out of a trading range, um, buy straddles, buy strangles. And a key part as well is to embrace the ever-changing order embedded within the chaos. So now, of course, we don't know definitively whether we're going to make money on any particular trade. That's why we have to manage the risk on every single trade. Um, but certainly there's order within the chaos. Certainly there's probability and the ability to, um, to play the odds and manage the risk is what makes us successful as traders. So at this point, I'd like to um, open it up to any questions. Richard, thank you for uh, your time on the presentation. Um, we'll go ahead and whoever would like to answer any, ask any questions, go ahead and use your chat or the Q&A button at the top of the WebEx. Um, I'll go ahead and start off with the first one. I've known you for oh, about three years now. Richard, I've never asked you this, but it did come up um, when you first started this presentation. In your own personal trading, do you tend to use more of a trend model or a mean reversion or a mixture of both? Um, and why? I tend to... Yeah, I tend to use the models, um, uh, you know, more sophisticated iterations of the models that I'm showing in this presentation. So, for example, um, I tend to use um, trend following models, except they're more complicated than this one. And I tend to use um, mean reversion models, um, except uh, they're more complicated than this one. The mean reversion models do tend to look a lot like this. In other words, that they're using some type of oscillator to determine is it overbought or oversold, and then they're using a longer-term trend-following filter. Um, uh, the third element that you don't see in either one of these models, but that I do tend to lean on very heavily, is what I like to call the cyclical nature of volatility. So I'd like, I'd like the... Um, the, the viewers to kind of think of volatility as, as a binary. Either we're in low volatility and you want to look for a breakout from low volatility and therefore you would be um, orienting yourself more towards a uh, breakout trend following model when you're in low volatility. Uh, as defined by something like ADX, for example. And then when you're in high volatility as defined by something like ADX, you would want to focus more on these counter trend mean reversion models. Um, but of course, the key with the counter trend mean reversion models, as I've already stated, is to only take trades that are in the direction of the longer term trend. All right, thank you, Richard, for that answer. And I don't see any other questions immediately coming up. Richard, would you, would you give out your email if anyone has a question at a later date or time? 
sure here. Let me do that. I think it's on the last. Yeah, there you go. That's the best way to reach me is rweissman at emi.org. Um, so, yeah, the, the 800 number is the, you're not going to reach me with that number. The best way to reach me is via email. Okay, well, I um, I don't see any questions coming through the chat over here, but um, I want to thank you for your time, Richard. And okay. as I mentioned, we will have a signed copy of Trade Like a Casino, and uh, me will be contacting one of the attendees of uh, on who wins the uh, wins the book. But um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, end the presentation here and. And you guys have Richard's contact information, or certainly you can also reach me, Doug at CQG dot com, and I can um, get you hooked up with Richard also. Thank you, Richard, so much for uh, for your time today. Okay, thank you for your help, Doug. No problem. Okay, we're going to end the uh, session here. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye.